Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu, in for Matt Miller. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And Scarlett, it is our first show of the new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. And the countdown is on for a spot Bitcoin ETF. That's actually all we're going to talk about. So on that note, let's get to the biggest stories right now in the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry. And after Bitcoin soared in 2023, investors await spot Bitcoin ETF approval in 2024. We'll give you the latest. We'll speak with someone who already has a Bitcoin futures ETF. That's Simeon Hyman of ProShares and his Bitcoin strategy ETF. And we actually are going to talk about something other than Bitcoin. Just briefly, in just a few moments, we'll speak to State Street about record-breaking flows for SPY. Katie, as always, Eric Bautrinas from Bloomberg Intelligence is here with us to give us a snapshot of flows. What do you have, Eric? Scarlett, Katie, happy new year to both you guys. And let's look at the flows for the first five days. Well, I should say, it actually dips into last year. We're, we're looking at a five-year rolling flows. And you can see at the top here, shortly, that IWM is at the top. This is interesting to me because everybody's waiting and hoping small caps can play catch up. And according to, again, this is probably a model trade, 1.8 billion, but that's not all. 3.3 billion went into small caps, 21% of the flows the past five days into small caps. Maybe people are going to will this rally up uh, and you know, basically try to outcompete with the Magnificent Seven, which has been driving the market for the past year. Also look on this list, a lot of S&P 500, including Upro, which is a leveraged S&P. So people still piling into beta, if you will, but small caps to me, most interesting thing to watch. Let's look at the outflows. Uh, HYG at the top, that's a little bit of risk off. Again, a lot of people moving models around. Look for a lot of flows into different sectors as well. IWD also outflows. That's value and energy, right? So some money coming out of value. And see USLC number five and USCA eight. Those are those two climate ETFs that the institution funded. 500 million out of that, sort of continuing the rough year for ESG that we saw last year into this year. So let's take a step back and look at 2023 just as we get uh, Spider up here to talk with them, because I gotta be honest, I, I could not have called this. No analyst could have. Spy at the top, this thing was supposed to be on their way out. For you sports fan, it reminds me of Joe Flacco coming back with the Browns. This guy was not even playing last year. And then you look, VU, IVV, these are three, I call them three amigos, all three at the top. S&P 500 beat almost everything except the Qs. And so a lot of money piled into here. But look, nothing in here is small caps, or value or international. So again, a big theme going into this year is whether some of these areas can play catch up. Uh, we've heard this story before and they never do. Maybe this will be the year though. Maybe this will be the year, but let's meditate on last year a little bit more and start at the top of the leaderboard because joining our conversation now is Matt Bartolini. He is head of Spider Americas over at State Street. And we have to talk about that SPY inflow. December 15th, almost $21 billion flowing into SPY on a single day. I have to admit, I saw that. I said, that must be a data glitch. That must be a mistake. Uh, maybe it was, you know, aliens coming to Earth. Maybe it was tax loss harvesting somehow. Maybe it was model portfolios. What actually drove what happened on the 15th? Well, first of all, it was 100% organic, right? It was no sort of in, internal money that was coming into it. Sometimes you do see those with massive inflows one day and then some outflows the next day. I think what we saw on that day also sort of reflects what we saw for basically the broader December where, you know, SPY's diverse user base sought out the funds as a tool for action during the year-end market rally due to its size, optionality, liquidity, flexibility, and fungibility versus other S&P 500 instruments. And those buying behavior motivations are truly unique to SPY and sort of reinforce its position as a market leader and a pretty systemically important financial instrument. On that specific day, you had some significant options expiry. You also had the S&P 500 index rebalancing settle. You also had the futures and single index futures settling as well. But also you had this market rally that was leading to a lot of beta chasing and some momentum chasing from a whole diverse slate of investors that really sort of converge into one vehicle with SPY, which can handle this massive amount of liquidity, trading volume, and primary market activity as well. You mentioned liquidity, you mentioned fungibility. Uh, going back to Eric's point about the three amigos, SPY's expense ratio is three times that of VU and IVV. Are those attributes worth three times the cost? Well, I mean, investors definitely feel like it is because we saw 50 billion of inflows in, in all of 2023, but also not only taking the primary market flow crown, SPY took the secondary market trading volume crown as well, trading over $8.7 trillion in 2023. And in some respects, some of the traders and investors that go into SPY are merely looking at it for 
that flexibility, the optionality, the amount of options volume that trades within SPY is really beneficial to in and of itself, sort of irregardless of what the uh, ex uh, expense ratio is. I mean, we look at all of these buffered ETFs, they're using SPY options as the underliers to construct their market exposure. So in some regards, expense ratio is just one input into the buying behavior decision. And some of the others are the size, that liquidity, the optionality, and the flexibility versus those other S&P 500 instruments. Yeah, and Matt, totally. I, I give it up for SPY. I do think a good chunk of the December flows are tax loss harvesting money, which is short term. It will probably come out in January. We think SPY could see record outflows in January. That said, you built up a base and you earned that $50 billion for sure. It's a legit record. But we've been writing notes that we think VU is probably the, the ETF that's going to pass SPY in the next three or four years as the next king of ETFs. Um, you think you can hold them off? So a lot of people have come at SPY, and, and I, you know, I love pop culture, and I'll invoke, I'll invoke Omar from The Wire. You come at the king, you best not miss. And we just took in $50 billion last year in our 30th year, and we really showed the benefit we can provide to investors particularly looking for a diverse range of buying behavior motivations, right? Different use cases. One of the use cases that I think no other ETF can probably have is what drove a lot of those flows as well. You know, this arbitrage mechanism of SPY versus futures, this funding environment, this funding environment trade, it is inherently unique to SPY. The buffered outcome ETFs using SPY options, that is unique to SPY. So the, obviously there's going to be different levels of buying behavior for other funds, but SPY in its 30th year was within $3 billion of being the first ETF to get $500 billion. SPY was also the one of the first ETFs to ever have the most primary market volume as well as secondary market volume. And mm -hmm. I know you love your sports analogies. That was like when Michael Jordan won the Defensive Player of the Year and the MVP in 1988. All right, Matt, I'm pretty sure that was a mic drop, and I'm already getting lost on the sports references. So <laughs> let's move on from SPY and its record-breaking year, and let's talk about Bitcoin, because, of course, we are counting down to potential U.S. spot Bitcoin approval uh, for an, a spot ETF. It feels like everyone and their mother has filed for a spot Bitcoin ETF, except for Vanguard and except for State Street. And that's really interesting to me, because Vanguard kind of makes sense. Uh, they don't even have commodity ETFs. But State Street, you're the home of G. LD. That, of course, is the largest commodity ETF. It's physically backed. Why haven't you thrown your hat in the ring for a spot Bitcoin ETF? Well, I mean, State Street as a company is littered throughout all of the different filings as a administrator, the cash custodian, transfer agent. So State Street is partaking in the spot Bitcoin ETF race overall. I think from an asset management side, those are things that we can't really talk about from a securities regulation perspective of what we may or may not do in terms of our own filing for a spot Bitcoin ETF. So we're going to have to leave it there, but State Street as an entity is mm. very much invested into the spot Bitcoin ETF launching. And again, as a major sort of systemically important bank, as a custodian, transfer agent, administrator. Okay, so you're involved, but maybe not directly as of yet. Once this spot Bitcoin ETF is approved, and it's really a when, not an if kind of question, to what extent are you worried about what that means for GLD? Not really. I mean, gold and Bitcoin can co coexist be uh, besides each other. Um, some of the motivations of buying GLD are diversification. Uh, I think, you know, again, not I'm trying to make not make a comparison because I think you really can't compare the two asset classes. One's been around since basically, uh, you know, zero BC, and the other one's been around for about, you know, a little over a decade. Um, so I think the buying behavior motivations are going to be quite different, and I actually don't see um, that much of a sort of impediment to any GLD or GLDM flows from that perspective. And Matt, just real quickly, 30 seconds, you guys hired Anna Paglia, who was uh, over at Invesco. Um, you, you know, what's your plan for this year? What's that about? What can we look out for? Well, I think our plan for this year is to continue to build on our strengths. I mean, last year, I know SPY got a lot of the attention, but we made some pretty significant expense ratio cuts within our Spider portfolio ETF range. And that continues to take in uh, overall market share within the low cost arena. We've also launched a few different active strategies and continue to build that area out as well. Uh, so I think that's really where we're focused is providing these tailored solutions to end clients so they can have better outcomes. All right, Matt, really great to catch up with you. Happy New Year. That is Matt Bartolini of State Street. Now coming up, we discuss the best performing ETF ever on an annual basis, but can you figure out what it is? Stay tuned. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF world. And given that it's our first show of 2024, I thought we'd reflect on what a year 2023 was, especially when it comes to launches. You had nearly 500 ETFs launched last year. That is a record. You can see beating the previous record of two years ago. Of course, we also saw near record closures on the other end, but that's a different chart, a different story. Let's stay positive and talk about the best performing ETFs of last year up at the top. Up there you can see WGMI that stands for we're going to make it that is a uh, popular say saying on crypto Twitter and uh, this crypto linked equity ETF rose 300 and 4% last year. Just a staggering rally, as you can see. That is a record uh, in a given year for any equity ETF, excluding leverage. And of course, that comes as we count down to a potential spot Bitcoin ETF. And on that topic, John Palmer of SIBO Digital spoke to Bloomberg Crypto yesterday about what kind of investors the new ETFs will potentially attract. Seeing that approval really is going to pave the way for pension funds and RIA-based funds to be able to invest assets in, in, in a spot Bitcoin ETF where they may not be able to gain that access today in just a native spot uh, Bitcoin token. Katie, let's stay with this and discuss the issue further with James Seyfert of Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, James, very quickly, just give us the latest on the filings because multiple applicants, including BlackRock and Fidelity, did submit some amended filings. What did we learn? Yeah, so we're, we're, we've narrowed this down, Eric and I have, to primarily 11 issuers that we're looking at. So there's been, the SEC wanted some amended filings by December 29th. We have roughly 11 filers that have met that goal. Um, not all of them have all of the information that we need to see that the SEC likely needs to see before they let these things launch. But we think we're, right now we're on track to potentially see 11 different ETF issuers get approval next week. We're, we're looking at January 8th to January 10th is when we think these approval orders could come down. Um, but it looks like the, the SEC has been signaling in the steps they've been taking that it is going to happen. So obviously we believe that approvals are going to happen. Um, but yeah, th there's 11 different issuers, including BlackRock, ARK, Bitwise, Invesco. I, can, I, I won't name all of them, <laughs> but some of them, they need to fill in a few other things. Uh, with the, before they launch, they'll have to announce what their actual fee is going to be, which we have seen some of that. And they'll also have to all name their authorized participants, which are part of the back-end plumbing of ETFs, which only a handful have done that so far. So we're, we're looking for more potential updates this week and definitely next week uh, to get all, this thing, all of this squared away. And James, as you mentioned, there's still a few holes when it comes to some of these applications, but let's talk more about fees since uh, that really fascinates me here. Uh, Fidelity coming in with just 39 basis points. That's below even GLD. That seems quite low. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Fidelity, that, that, I, I'm not that surprised. Fidelity, with their application, is relatively vertically integrated. So they have, they have exposure directly through the back end to advi many advisors. They're the back end solution for a lot of advisors and brokers. Then you also have the fact that they are a Bitcoin custodian. So you can actually custody Bitcoin with them with a subsidiary of theirs, not to mention they're an asset manager. So basically, all of these things, for the most part, obviously, there's some other aspects here that they will need to outsource admin and different things like that. But for the most part, they're very vertically integrated and they're coming in. That's the low stick right now. Yeah. Obviously, we have Invesco and Galaxy that they have a six month fee waiver. So they're going to do zero percent. And then after six months, they're going to go to uh, zero point five nine percent. But still, Fidelity is the low stick right now at thirty nine basis points. But we haven't seen we haven't seen BlackRock's number yet. Yeah, BlackRock uh, could be the new low in terms of a fee. You mentioned earlier APs, authorized uh, participants. Is it a conflict of interest that Jane Street keeps coming up to be the AP for multiple issuers, whether it's Fidelity, Wisdom Tree, or BlackRock? I wouldn't say it's a conflict of interest. One of the things you hear from a lot of people that critique the ETF ecosystem is that it's primarily the same handful of people that are authorized participants on the vast majority of ETFs. So it's not shocking that the main market makers and authorized participants in this instance are Jane Street, is Jane Street. But Virtu, Jane Street, these are names you see on pretty much any ETF out there. You name it, they're, they're probably trading in it. Um, and honestly, I, so I don't think it's a conflict of interest, but it just shows that they're, they're the ones that people have fixated on. And like I said, we haven't seen 
everyone else. So they could be on even more than the four that we've seen them on. But you've seen Vert 2 on one. JP Morgan is on two of them, which is ironic enough. Karen Fitzgerald is there. And I, I think we'll see other names. And I think we'll see these names we've already seen on multiple places. Like we know for a fact that Vert 2 and Jane Street likely signed authorized participation agreements with Grayscale back in 2022 before they were ultimately denied. So they'll likely be with Grayscale. So we'll see if new names pop up. But I don't, I don't think it's a conflict of interest. And uh, Grayscale, last I checked, hasn't yet named an authorized participant or participant, so that'll be fascinating to watch. James, know you're a busy man. Appreciate the times. That is James Seyfert of Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, still ahead, we drill down deeper into crypto with Simeon Hyman of ProShares. Coming up next, this is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu along with Katie Greifeld. And Eric Bouchon is from Bloomberg Intelligence. Back with us now for today's Drill Down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, hit it. Katie, today we have the legendary Bitto. This was basically the first Bitcoin ETF launched in the U.S. about two years ago. Now again, this holds futures, right? Bitcoin futures. It is actively managed, so it doesn't track an index. It picks the futures out. Normally holds the first two months, the next two months out. So January and February right now. And look at here, it's derivative based. Again, this is part of why everybody wants spot. They generally like to have things physically backed. We can talk about the uh, difference, uh, the parallel with gold in a minute. Um, huge ETF at $1.7 billion. That's the biggest Bitcoin ETF in the world uh, to date. And then we have 95 basis point expense ratio. This thing is very liquid. People are now using this uh, to trade, even institutions. So let's look at what it holds. As I said, you're going to see two futures contracts in here, January and February. And when the next, when January gets closer, they're going to roll into March. So they're going to hold March and February. That idea of rolling is part of the reason people don't prefer futures if you have physical available, uh, because you get that little bit of roll costs. Um, so maybe we can get a chart of the performance. There's the, the holdings there that I mentioned, January, February. Again, 50-50-ish. And now let's look at the performance of this ETF over the past 12 months. It had a Banner 12 months, up 140%, but spot was up 157, so that 17% is rolling. This number will be higher in bull markets, lower in bear markets. But if you're up 140, uh, you know, how upset are you going to be? But that, uh, that, that said, this is where the spot ETF comes into play. So, Katie um, and Scar, this is going to be fascinating to see how this ETF fares once these spot ETFs are approved. Eric, thank you. And joining us now to talk about this ETF is Simeon Hyman. He is global investment strategist over at ProShares. And let's start there. The bear case for Bitto would be that once you have spot Bitcoin ETFs out there, that the futures back products become obsolete. What's your pushback? Well, listen, we were, of course, thrilled to bring this to market over two years ago. Fastest ETF to a billion dollars. We saw $600 million of flows last year, and it's in the top 5% of volume every day. So liquidity, really important. But let's talk about a few things that are important about futures and what they achieve. It's a mature and liquid and regulated place. And combining that in ETF, that belt and suspenders, if you will, has proven to be quite efficacious. There are a lot of things we don't know about the spot market. Number one, things, things that we do know that futures solves. There are multiple prices for Bitcoin. Futures solve it. It's an amalgamation of multiple prices that give you that settlement every day. Other things we don't know. We don't know exactly how cash create in a, in, in a spot ETF will work. We know exactly how we've been creating futures with high volume and tight spreads for over two years now. So those are really important things. And if you think about that roll cost, you know, it's funny. We talked about this on air several times, this notion that a financial future, financial future shouldn't have any storage costs. In other words, that number that kind of looks small in the context of the big return, it almost shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, if you take it from inception, it's about 6% and almost half that's fee. But think about it. It's almost analogous to a storage cost. And why do I say that? The spot market is still a little, let's call it weird. Mm. FTX, Binance, stuff, things, shaggy haired guy in the news. <laughs> the access to the futures market, that roll cost, it's almost like a pseudo storage cost. Won't be there forever, but 
futures mature, regulated spot question marks. You bring up some good points here. And nevertheless, once spot Bitcoin ETF does come out and is approved, there's going to be a shift over. What are you thinking about or how are you thinking about how long this allocation will take place? Are we talking days, weeks, months? Well, again, we don't know because we don't know how they're going to perform. Um, so I think you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all have to see you know, how, how they perform, how the creates work, how the tracking actually works. You know, we have a spot Bitcoin in, in uh, Canada, which is about 500 basis points off of Bitcoin this year. So even, and, and the volume there is like tiny, so we know that much. And of course, the other thing we know of ProShares is we don't just only have Bitto, we also have BITI, Biddy. And so a futures-based product on the short side is the only game in town. So mm -hmm. we're very pleased to be offering that as well. And, you know, you talk about the cash crates. There are about 450 ETFs currently and ETNs that are cash only. And I looked, you know, if they have a lot of volume, their spreads are tight. I, I think we'll see the same thing. The couple that are getting a lot of volume, I think this, the spreads will be rather tight. I guess we'll see. Um, now, DGL was a gold futures ETF, went extinct earlier this year. It took 10, 20 years to go extinct. But with all that, are you hoping to be used by the market makers in the actual arbitrage process and the market making? Or do you think they'll just use futures directly? Look, we don't know. But what we do know is that liquidity that you mentioned that's in the futures marketplace, CME Futures cranks more volume than the largest U.S. spot exchange. And we know our ETF is very liquid. So no doubt there could be a range of, of uses for our ETF. Uh, and it's really been proven its effectiveness over the last couple of years. And we don't have much time left. Uh, just in 40 seconds or so, uh, Bitto's fee is 95 basis points. You think about Fidelity coming in with their spot product at 39 basis points. Uh, is ProShares going to cut fees to stay competitive? You know, I, I wear the investment strategist hat, so I'm usually not in those discussions. Um, but we, we, uh, we compete on innovation, and we're pleased to do that. All right, Simeon, really appreciate your time. Thanks for stopping by. That is Simeon Hyman of ProShares. And a reminder that we're going to be back at our normal time next week. That is Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Of course, we're going to continue to beat the drum on the way to uh, U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF approval, whether or not it comes this month. It seems, of course, like Scarlett said, more of a matter of when rather than if. Uh, we'll continue to cover this story fully. And if you just can't get enough of ETFs, a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions. It's their podcast that covers the ETF industry. But for now, that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifel along with Scarlett Fu and Eric Alchunas, and this is Bloomberg.